good morning. Uh, my name is Fraser Doherty. I'm 23 years old. I come from Edinburgh in Scotland, and I'm the founder of a jam company called Super Jam. And I was very kindly invited along today to share my story with you. The story of how I learned my grandmother's secret jam recipe at the age of 14, and over the past seven or eight years, have turned it into a company that now supplies more than a thousand supermarkets around the world. I guess my adventures as an entrepreneur began at an unusually young age. And in fact, ever since I was a little boy, I was involved in coming up with ideas to try and start my own business. And probably the most harebrained story of all comes from when I was about 10 years old and I visited a chicken farm with my childhood friend. And we convinced this farmer to give us a box of eggs, which we took home to my mum and dad and explained that we had this great business idea that we would keep the eggs warm so they would hatch and we would start a chicken farm in the back garden. <laughs> And as I'm sure you can imagine, my parents were delighted with this idea of having chickens running around everywhere. But they let us give it a shot, not really expecting two 10-year-olds to find a way of hatching eggs. And so we put the box of eggs on top of the TV, where it was kind of <laughs> warm. And amazingly, a few weeks later, four of these eggs hatched into little chickens. And I mean, the poor things probably thought that Jerry Springer was their mum, you know. But <laughs> we raised them in the house and gave them names and soon we put them out into the back garden and they started laying eggs which we sold to the neighbours. So that was my first ever business at the age of 10. Unfortunately though, my career as a chicken farmer was sadly ended one afternoon when the local fox decided to eat my chickens for dinner. And as tragic and upsetting as that day was, it didn't put me off entirely. And I continued to come up with more and more ideas to try and start my own business. And so one afternoon when I was 14 years old, I was visiting my grandmother and she was making jam in her kitchen just in the same way as she had for as long as I can remember. Uh, that's a picture of my grand there. Uh, she's the one in the middle. <laughs> And uh, I got really excited about it and asked my gran to teach me how to make jam. And we spent the afternoon making a few jars together. And the same day I ran around to the supermarket and bought some fruit and made a few jars of my own. And before they'd even cooled down, I took them around the neighborhood and asked the neighbors what they thought. And thankfully the neighbors at least told me that they enjoyed the first few jars of jam that I had ever made and asked if they could start buying it from me every couple of weeks. So I was soon delivering my homemade jam out of a little plastic bucket door to door all over the local area. I came up with some labels on the computer at home and after a while the local newspaper heard about this story of a young guy taking his grand's jam recipes and making a little business out of them. And that's an article from page three of the Edinburgh Evening News from when I was about 15 years old, uh, which probably just meant there wasn't very much happening in town that day. <laughs> for something like that to make it into the paper. But following the excitement of being written about in the paper, I decided to start working full time on trying to turn my jam making hobby into my career. And so I soon found myself cooking jam all day, every day, in my parents' tiny little kitchen, cooking up to a thousand jars of jam a week and selling them at farmers markets all over Scotland. Soon they got to the point where my parents couldn't get into the kitchen to cook the dinner anymore. And I realized that I would have to come up with some kind of big idea in order to move production into a factory. And so I started doing a lot of research and I found out that sales of jam have been in decline for the past couple of decades. Mostly because jam is very unhealthy, it's maybe 70% sugar and I guess when I looked at all of the brands of jam on the supermarket shelves I figured they were kind of traditional, maybe boring and I just figured I could try and come up with something healthier and more modern and more fun. And so hundreds of batches and dozens of recipes later in my parents' tiny little kitchen I came up with a way of making jam 100% from fruit without adding any sugar or anything artificial. I soon had a few flavors that I thought tasted pretty nice and probably quite naively 
decided I was going to try and sell them to the big supermarkets. And that was something a teenager had never done before. So I was invited along to a Waitrose Meet the Buyer Day. And Waitrose are one of the big supermarkets and they have these Meet the Buyer Days, which I like to describe as the X factor of selling groceries to supermarkets. <laughs> <laughs> and hundreds of people show up and stand in a queue holding their homemade soups and cakes and sauces and everybody gets 10 minutes to pitch their idea, in my case, to the senior jam buyer of Waitrose. <laughs> he said it was a great idea. He said it was very refreshing to see a kid trying to reinvent something that's been around for hundreds of years. But he explained to me there was a long way to go until I would ever have a product that could sit on the shelves of a supermarket. I'd have to set up production in a factory and offer them a good price. I'd have to get labels designed that explain to people why they should buy my product. And I'd have to do a bit more work on my recipes before he'd be happy. But he promised that if I could do all of that, I'd be welcome to go back maybe in a year's time and he'd think about giving it a shot. So having met with Waitrose, it became my dream to get my products into their stores. And I began by trying to create the Super Jam brand, the kind of look and feel of the whole thing. And I got in touch with lots of designers to ask how much that might cost. And most came back with quotes of 10, 20, even 30,000 pounds, which I'm sure you can imagine at 17 was somewhat out with my budget. But <laughs> Eventually, I found some designers who thought it would be a fun project to work on on a Friday afternoon. They figured if it was a success, maybe they'd benefit from repeat business. And so the designers and I sat down and had to think about what these labels should look like. And we figured that there was a link between Super Jam and Superman, or so we thought at least, and decided to create the brand around a comic book theme. <laughs> And we had a lot of fun writing jokes on the labels <laughs> and on the lids. <laughs> and we even spoke about making a superhero costume for me, the jam boy. <laughs> to... <laughs> and so we then had this set of labels that I thought looked pretty cool. And certainly my friends thought were very funny. And I began trying to solve the problem of how we would produce hundreds of thousands of jars of jam to sell to the big supermarkets. And obviously at 17, I wasn't in a position to build a jam factory. And so I was going to have to convince an existing manufacturer to work with me to make the products on a big scale. And so I traveled around the country from the tiny little islands in Scotland to the big cities in England, trying to find somebody who'd be willing to work with me to make this super jam. And as I'm sure you can imagine, most of these 200-year-old, very traditional family businesses were a bit skeptical of a 17-year-old turning up with no money and no experience. And in fact, not very much more than just this set of labels and a vague ambition to transform the world of jam. But eventually I found this one factory who had suffered from the decline in jam sales and they had a lot of spare capacity and they figured that maybe Super Jam would be the answer to their problems. And so a few months later we'd figured out how to produce the recipes on a big scale and I figured we were ready to start supplying supermarkets. Uh, Waitrose didn't agree. Uh, <laughs> They explained to me that the fact that Super Jam was made completely from fruit was completely lost in all the jokes and humor on the comic book labels. They said the factory I chose was too expensive and they didn't even like the flavors I'd made. So basically everything that I'd just spent a year working on had to be thrown in the bin and I started all over again. So I traveled around the country a bit more and eventually convinced a new factory to work with me. The designers and I sat down and had a really good think about who we were trying to communicate with. Who was going to buy this super jam? And I guess we clarified to ourselves that it wasn't kids and teenagers and my friends who <laughs> might have found the comic book idea funny. But it would be adults and we'd have to communicate really simply that super jam was 100% fruit. And so I started asking other entrepreneurs for advice and something I've been amazed by all along the way is how willing people are to share what they've learned. And one brand that I asked for advice were called Method and they make natural cleaning products in America and I have to say it was the first time I'd ever had any interest in cleaning products but 
I was struck by the idea that they make a product that usually is so badly designed and so ugly that people hide it away under the kitchen sink. And they created a product that was, dare I say, beautiful and that people wouldn't be ashamed of leaving out on the counter for guests to see. So I was really inspired by their story. Another brand I got some advice from were called Dorset Cereals and they make muesli and granola and I was struck by the idea that their packaging is so simple it just kind of says what needs to be said that it actually stands out against the really colourful noisy brands of Kellogg's. But probably the brand that I was most inspired by and that I got a lot of advice from were Innocent and I love the tone of voice on their packaging and they gave me all kinds of advice, but probably the best piece they gave was that a brand should have one message that it's trying to get across. They said that too many people say, here are the 10 reasons why you should buy my product. And they figured if you put all of your energy into just trying to get one message across, then maybe people would listen to it. And so taking on board all of their advice, I, we came up with some labels that didn't work <laughs> until eventually we came up with some that did. And I think the packaging is really modern and simple and hopefully stands out against the really traditional brands of jam that are already on the shelves. And thankfully, Waitrose agreed. And they launched Super Jam in all of their stores about five years ago. And that obviously meant we had to do the first production run, which was a really exciting and emotional day. I think we made about 50,000 jars on the first day. And when Super Jam launched, in Waitrose there was a huge amount of media coverage and we didn't do anything to try and make it happen. I didn't expect that um, newspapers and radio shows and TV shows would cover my story and even the biggest news show in China covered the story of this wee Scottish guy getting his grand's jam into the supermarkets. <laughs> and so I guess to take advantage of all of this media coverage I decided to go on a rock and roll style tour. <laughs> around all the supermarkets, <laughs> handing out samples and signing jars of jam <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, telling people all about my gran and my story. And I think on the first day in one store in Edinburgh where I'm from, they sold more than one and a half thousand jars of super jam. It was more jam than they would normally sell in a month. They'd never seen anything like it. <laughs> And I think it got to the point where if anybody tried to go through the checkout without buying a jar of super jam, <laughs> the person sat at the checkout would ask them why. <laughs> and so then we had a big party when we sold the millionth jar. Uh, we launched in Tesco and Asda and Sainsbury's and all the other big supermarkets. I got invited to go and have dinner with Gordon Brown, the Prime Minister at Downing Street, which was kind of cool. The products got put in the National Museum of Scotland as an example. <laughs> <laughs> as an example of an iconic Scottish brand <laughs> alongside Iron Brew and Baxter Soup and Walker Shortbread. <laughs> My story got used as part of Orange, the mobile phone company's advertising, but probably the biggest promotion that we ever did was we gave away a free jar of Super Jam to every reader of the Sun newspaper. And I think about five and a half million people read the Sun every day. It's the biggest newspaper in the English speaking world. And so my proudest moment of all as a Scottish person was being able to share the front page of the Sun with Susan Boyle. <laughs> 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 um, another particular highlight of mine uh, was uh, making my debut on QVC, the home shopping channel, uh, <laughs> where I, I go on there and tell the story and people phone up and, and order live, uh, live on air. And uh, so far we've been selling almost a thousand pounds a minute when I've been on QVC. It's been a, a huge success and they've invited me to go and do QVC in America and we're even going to have quite soon an hour long Super Jam show. <laughs> which uh, you must, must be sure to tune into. <laughs> um, uh, about six months ago, uh, as well as launching Super Jam in some other countries, we launched in Australia. And I was very kindly invited to go on Sunrise with Koshi and uh, he had a lot of nice things to say and really helped to kind of kick things off. 
probably the most unusual country that we've launched Super Jam in would be Russia, somewhere I never would have imagined I would, I would ever find myself. Um, but I was invited to go and cook jam on a Russian cookery show, uh, which was kind of funny because they dubbed it in a very scary, manly Russian voice. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we had a lot of success getting into all the big supermarkets and I wanted to try and find a way of getting into lots of little independent stores and I wasn't too sure how to do that. So we put this page on the website where we just asked people who were already buying our products to maybe tell us about a store in their area that they thought could sell Super Jam. And it's a really simple idea but if that shop goes on to place an order we send the person who suggested it some jam to say thank you. And because of that page we've had thousands and thousands of suggestions of little shops all over the world that people think could sell our products and that's really helped Super Jam to grow. I guess we became the first jam company in the world to launch an iPhone app <laughs> <laughs> with uh, recipes and videos and other bits and pieces. Uh, we're about to launch a range of jams for kids um, with kind of fun packaging and without any seeds because kids don't like seeds. <laughs> Something I'm really excited about is setting up uh, Super Honey. And when I was a kid, I, I actually used to help a local beekeeper with his bees, and he would pay me in honey, which I, I also sold out of my plastic bucket to the neighbors. <laughs> and um, I had the idea that uh, just kind of based on that experience I had with him and all the things I learned uh, about beekeeping, I thought it would be great to put beehives into schools, uh, as dangerous as that sounds, uh, and scout groups and community gardens, and uh, to kind of give kids an opportunity to learn about beekeeping and the environment and sustainable food, uh, but also because uh, everywhere outside of Australia, the bees are having a really hard time. Uh, in some places, almost half of the colonies are collapsing year on year. And so it's a huge environmental problem. Um, a, couple of years, a couple of weeks ago, I got to meet one of my heroes to tell him about my idea, uh, Jerry from Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream. And uh, as well as hopefully putting some money into the idea, he's sending me to Uganda uh, to go and uh, live with a family who grow uh, vanilla for the ice cream so I can go and learn all about fair trade. I'm really excited about that. I guess Super Jam has kind of gratefully received a number of awards along the way, and I'm not telling you about them to boast by any means, but the one that I'm most proud of is called the Global Student Entrepreneur of the Year Award. And that was a competition where about 700 students from all over the world were asked to go to Chicago and do a pitch about their business to a panel of judges who were really successful entrepreneurs. I think six of them were billionaires, and most of the students in the competition were running dot-com businesses, uh, software companies. Some of them had invented these electronic gadgets that nobody could really understand. And I was there selling jam and <laughs> amazingly won the award. And I got to meet some other young people who had started their own businesses and that was really inspiring for me. Some of them were doing amazing things. Um, the guy on the right there was from Sweden and his company made the software that managed McDonald's employees all over the world. And the guy on the right uh, was from Canada, and his company at the time was, I think, the fifth fastest growing company in Canada. They sold concert tickets on the internet. And so I was really inspired to meet all of these other young people. But I guess the moral of that story was that a good idea doesn't necessarily have to be high tech, it doesn't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. And it's possible to make something extraordinary out of something as ordinary as jam. And so I guess from the point of view of sales and media coverage and even winning a few awards, it's all been quite a success and something of an adventure and that's all fine and well. But I guess something I'm really excited about and ambitious for is setting up a charity. And to give you a bit of background, when my grandmother originally made jam, she would make jam and scones and cakes and she'd drag my little brother and I with her around all these care homes and uh, she'd visit elderly people who maybe lived on their own and I guess it was just something she felt strongly about. And so I thought it'd be nice to try and do something like that on a bigger scale. And a couple years ago, we started running tea parties in community centers 
centres and schools and hospitals, uh, originally just in Scotland, but we now do them all over the UK. We've even had a couple over here in Australia. And the events are completely free to come along to. We have live music and dancing and scones and jam. And it's really just a chance for the elderly people to get out of the house and have a bit of fun. Uh, in the past year, we've probably had about 120 tea parties. Uh, the biggest ones have maybe 600 people at them. So thousands of people have come along and hopefully had a nice time. As part of the Tea Parties project, we have a Tea Cozy of the Week competition, <laughs> where, the, uh, where the folks who come along knit tea cozies to go on the teapots to keep the tea warm. And uh, we feature a different one on the blog every week. Uh, this one is a mouse. Um, we've even had a Jesus Tea Cozy uh, <laughs> sent in from America. Um, I've got a little video of a tea party that I thought I would show you just to kind of bring it all to life. You don't need a Mad Hatter or a Cheshire Cat to have a wonderful tea party, just plenty of jam and scones. Today's tea party at Edinburgh's Meadowbank Stadium was set up by Fraser Doherty, the young entrepreneur who transformed his grand secret jam recipe into a multi-million pound super jam business. My grandmother taught me how to make jam when I was 14 and that's what started Super Jam off. Uh, when my gran originally made jam, she would make jam and scones and cakes and take them to all the elderly people in her area who were living alone and they were a little bit lonely and nobody really visited them very much and she would take my little brother and I with her at the weekends and um, so I guess it, visiting and caring for the elderly was something that my gran felt very strongly about and the tea party is an opportunity for me to give back to my gran's generation. So what are you hoping that the tea parties will achieve? Well, the idea is very simple. Um, a lot of the people who come along here live in care homes or sheltered housing or they live alone and the opportunity to make new friends and have a bit of fun on an afternoon is, is quite rare for them. And so this is an opportunity for them to, to just have a bit of fun, some jam and get up and have a dance if they like. It brings back very happy memories of when I was a youngster, a teenager, dancing in the city here in Princess Street Gardens and, and Marine down at Portobello. I just love this. It's just wonderful and can't get enough. And why do you think it's a good idea to lay it on to let all the older people come here this afternoon? A lot of old people are on their own and they need some entertainment and this mm -hmm. is what is good for us. You know, it keeps us active, it keeps us moving, it keeps us meeting people. Oh, that, that's our best idea. <laughs> Thousands of elderly people have come along and had a fun afternoon and made new friends and I've got a wall covered in letters from the guests who have come along and, and just told me how special it is. One gentleman told him that it made him feel like a person again. I was hoping to get a scone myself but I don't see any, they've all gone. Where's your secret stash? We, we always bring more scones to each tea party and, and every time we run out I think everybody just, just enjoys the scones and jam and uh, sometimes they can eat up to four scones each. <laughs> Fraser had its first tea party last June. There have since been over 100 events and the plan is to roll them out on a regular basis across the country. The aim being not only to give the older generation a chance to go out and have some fun, but also to interact with the younger generation. How am I doing, Walter? Yes, fine. Should we try another turn? Yes. Okay. Probably the best part of running the tea parties is interacting with the elderly people and, and just hearing their stories. Some of the guests are over 100 years old and you know they've lived through uh, wars, they've lived through the invention of television, of, of all sorts of things and uh, their stories are just incredible and, and often inspirational. And has your gran been along to one of the tea dances? What does she think? My, my gran's very excited about the tea parties. It's, a, it's an issue that she feels very strongly about and to be able to give back to her generation is, is really special to me. Thank you. Uh, so I guess to raise a bit of money for the tea parties, uh, a couple months ago my gran and I decided to share our jam making secrets with the world by publishing a cookbook all about how to make jam without adding sugar, how to make kind of classic British puddings like jam roly-poly and arctic roll and uh, the book's gone on to uh, sell a lot of copies and has raised a lot of money for the tea parties. And when we launched the book I thought it was a great opportunity to have a, a party to kind of thank everybody who had helped to make Super Jam a success up to that point. And we had a big vintage tea party with cocktails and teapots and dancing and um, it was just a great chance to say thank you. I've also written a book called Super Business all about my story and everything I've learned and all the great advice that people have given me along the way. Um, we also had a party when we launched that book. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> um, both the books have gone on to sell, I think, 50,000 copies and have raised a lot of money for the tea parties. They've been published in places like Japan and Korea, places that my gran and I would never have imagined our story would have gone. So I guess that kind of is my story. And perhaps what my story shows is that something that can begin for anybody as a hobby or a passion in a kitchen or a bedroom or a garage or a garden shed with a bit of love and imagination and hard work and support from the right people could grow into something amazing, could grow into something that changes your life. I know that Super Jam certainly changed mine. Could grow into something that gives you a career and maybe an opportunity to give something back to your community. I guess there's a number of people that I need to thank for making my story possible. Uh, not least, of course, my grandmother for teaching me how to make jam in the first place and inspiring the work that we do with the elderly. Uh, she's thankfully unaware of her intellectual property rights. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but she does get a lot of free jam. <laughs> no, she's uh, really proud of everything that's happened, of course. Uh, she goes into the supermarket and makes sure all the labels are facing the front and <laughs> turns the competitors around the wrong way. <laughs> And she's always calling me with little reports from how sales are doing in her local supermarket, you know. Um, my parents for letting me use their kitchen for years on end. Uh, but probably the best help and support I had was from having a mentor, a guy called Kevin, who had set up a really successful business supplying supermarkets. And he was just willing to spend a bit of time with me, sharing some of the lessons that he'd learned and telling me about mistakes that he had made. So I guess I would say to anybody, whether you're trying to start a business or not, there's people out there who have been there and done it before who can be your mentor. And there's bound to be young people who are trying to do what you've done, who you can be a mentor to. And so I guess the last people that I need to thank on my amazing adventure are all of you guys for very kindly having me here today. It's been a real honor to share my story with you. I'm going to be signing books at lunchtime if anybody wants to say hello, but other than that, Thank you.